What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to part two of this multi-part series where I'll be breaking down my 10K scoop main event run, where I was fortunate enough to make it pretty deep. So lots of hands to go through. And I'm going to use the same format as part one, of course, where we're showing all the hands, we're just pressing play and letting it run. And then I'll pause the action whenever there's an interesting spot or a hand I play, of course so we can discuss it further. And as you can see, we're still pretty deep, which is nice. It gives us a lot of room and playability, uh, a lot of spots that aren't that straightforward, which is always fun to break down. All right, it looks like we have a playable hand here with pocket nines. So in this spot, obviously versus under the gun and the call in the cutup, we want to have a very tight uh, squeezing range. Nines uh, does not make the cut uh, for a few reasons, but I would say the main reason I don't want to squeeze nines here is because when I'm squeezing here, I'm representing an extremely tight range, of course, and I'm more interested in using hands that has a good blocker effect. Uh, so I want to block hands that are mandatory continues versus my squeeze. So hands with a, an ace or a king in them, especially the small suited aces, of course. Hands that play well post-flop as well if we do get flatted, because as you can see, we're still very deep and we really don't want to bloat a big pot out of position with a hand that's tricky to play post-flop with. And with nines here, I'm actually, it's a really bad hand to squeeze here because it's blocking the weakest part of Daniel's opening range. So hands like 10-9 suited, uh, jack-9 suited, queen-9 suited, king-9 suited, uh, that's the bottom of his opening range here under the gun. I, I'm pretty certain about that. And uh, if I have two nines, obviously the probability of him having a nine on uh, one of those hands uh, goes way down. It's also the biggest portion of his folding range to my squeeze. So it's a really bad candidate to even consider squeezing here. And if we think about the cutoffs range, his calling range, obviously he's gonna have a lot of worse pairs. He's gonna have some better pairs. Uh, I don't think he's three betting tens or jacks or even queens here, uh, at least not all the time. Uh, and if I squeeze here, I'm folding out a lot of the worse pairs in his range if I, if I use a really big size, which I would elect to do since I'm so polarized. Um, but he's never folding tens or, or better pair, right? So I'm only folding up better and I'm only folding up worse, uh, I should say, um, and keeping better hands in play and bloating the pot. So yeah, it's just a bunch of arguments for not uh, squeezing here. So that's what I don't do. Um, yeah, so here we have a, a limp on the button, which is quite unusual to see, especially of this stack depth. Of shorter stack depths, of course, we see more limps in play. But here it's it's very tricky to know what kind of range, what his limping stride looks like here. And with King Jack, obviously I can go both ways. I can put in a race or just flat. I think there's pros and cons to doing both, but I prefer to just call here just because I want to keep his worst kings and jacks in play and king jack off doesn't play particularly well out of position so there's no reason to blow the pot out of position of this stack depth uh, versus an uncapped and uh, undefined range we also keep a lot of the big blinds uh, kings and, and jacks in this range uh, if we like to just uh, call here, but if we raise, we're gonna fold out a lot of worse kings and jacks in Daniel's range. So all in all, I just prefer to take the low variance route here. Of course, it's nice to get value from, you know, jack ten suited or whatnot, but I still think there's more merit to just keeping the pot small here. Yeah, so in the limp pot, uh, I don't really like leading that much because. Like I said, like the ranges are so undefined, so it's really hard to know exactly who has the range advantage here. You can make an argument for everyone having 
at least some piece of this board you know I, you know me and Daniel never has pocket nines or, or or queens here but we all have the suited two pairs Daniel has all the offsuit two pairs as well uh the big blind has a tons of draws on this hand like hands like jack 10 of spades or jack 8 of spades or whatever his limping strategy is I'm I'm pretty certain that this board is fairly good for him obviously it's going to break this completely sometimes so what I want to ask myself is like if I can fold out any better hands but I think since the ranges are so wide still uh, I just want to proceed with caution rather and yeah same argument for not raising preflop I want to keep the pot somewhat manageable and rather be a little bit conservative here so it does check around which is you know now we have a little bit more information about at least the buttons range obviously daniel is still uncapped here i don't think he plays many leads here for the same reason as i don't so he can still obviously have all the two pairs the button though uh, should not uh, check back a very strong hand here i would be very surprised if he did so especially given how small the pot is I really and how draw heavy the board is i really think you want to start building a pot here if you had like a two pair or an over pair or a strong queen sure you might check back you know a, a five or a nine uh mill pairs so he's kind of likely to have some sort of showdown value obviously a lot of ace highs as well we would check back maybe some king highs so i think my strategy here on the turn should be somewhat polarized in terms of my bets Obviously, I have a lot of value bets here, and I will have a lot of weak hands with very low showdown value that would benefit from folding out hands that has a king or a jack in them. So I don't think I want to go ahead and bet here. I actually have some decent amount of showdown value with that king high, and, and obviously I can play back versus a bet. I can easily call and, and bluff catch this combination and hope to show down or hit my straight or a pair on the river. So I think I prefer to continue checking here. And he checks around again, which is interesting. So now we have quite a lot of information, I think, or at least a lot more information about both opponents' ranges. And we do pair up on the river. Um, so this is a pretty interesting spot here. So now we want to ask ourselves how many kings are in our opponent's ranges uh, the way he play i think daniel's range is kind of hard to guess here he can have a wide range of hands obviously he can have some kings but he could also have some like he has a very wide range still because he hasn't really given us much information other than checking back or checking again on the turn but the button uh, i'm a little bit more concerned about i think he should have a fair amount of kings here if we think about the combinations that don't bet uh, until this point but has some sort of showdown value which is my assumption of his intention when he checks twice here after limping preflop i think he has a, a fair amount of king tens i think he bets a lot of the weaker kings actually uh so i think he would like king 10 is probably my most optimistic combination that i would get value from obviously he has a lot of ace kings two pairs now like like a king five suited the king nine suited king four suited i don't think he checks king queen twice but it doesn't really matter because i'll lose that combination anyway uh that being said though there are obviously a lot of weaker hands that can potentially call especially if i elect to block bet here so i think a block bet seems like a pretty enticing option here because there's a ton of hands that not gonna bet themselves if i if we check here but there's also a lot of hands that could potentially call especially a small bet if i bet like 30 percent here and also if i bet if i block bet here i limit the amount that i could potentially lose if my opponent has a better king because if he has ace king here he's more likely to put out a much bigger bet than 30 percent right he's probably betting closer to pot perhaps even over betting and then we're in a really tricky spot because now we really don't know where we're at and I mean we're forced to call because you know we have a pretty pretty strong holding but 
if we bet instead, and if we block bet, we bet 30%, he's pretty unlikely to raise that block bet size, I would say, even with a hand as strong as ace-king. I mean, he might sometimes, but regardless, I wouldn't say we're capped here by any means, so he should definitely be quite cautious if he's considering raising our block bet. So let's see what I do. I, oh, I do a bet pretty big. Um, I don't really like this, to be honest, because it's it's a kind of a weird size to use because I'm basically using I'm basically betting the amount that I think my hand is worth uh you know if we have sort of a middling hand here where you know I think I either want to bet really big with a polarized range so I want to bet pot maybe I uh, potentially over betting the pot uh with hands that isn't blocking anything in my opponent's calling range. So like when I'm betting for value, I want to bet like Jack-10, for example, that's unblocking all those King X2 pairs, uh, stuff that just has to bet, uh, but aren't unlikely to raise if I bet any smaller. And then I would balance that by betting big with my weaker hands that has absolutely zero showdown value. Um, a hand like three do suited or for example hands that don't block any of my opponent's hands that has showed them value that he would be likely to check back with uh, a hand like i mean bluffing a hand with an ace in it would be really bad here uh, for obvious reasons but so you really want to think about these things like you want to think about what am i trying to achieve here or like can i get how many better hands can i get to fold am i blocking any hands in my opponent's range that i'm targeting with my bet so yeah, that's why I don't like this bet size because it sound kind of in between and be pretty tricky to balance that. To be honest, uh, if I'm if I want to construct my range in a balanced way, which I of course do, uh, it would be quite tricky to find enough hands that make sense to bet that size. So back to back hands here. So this is a spot where I think in general we want to be fairly aggressive. We really want to attack the perceived capped range from the cutoff because when the cutoff flats here of the stack depth, he really doesn't have many slow plays. He doesn't have many strong hands that are able to play back versus us. So we're really mostly concerned about the low jacks opening range, but obviously the low jack here is going to open uh, a fairly wide range. There's a lot of hands that we can fold out. And with the added value of the cutoff's call, and the fact that we have position versus both, and especially with our particular holding, I think this is a perfect candidate to put in a squeeze here and putting that extra pressure on both ranges. Because the low jack, obviously, sure, the, the cutoff is somewhat capped, but he's, he can't really call that wide because he still has a player left to act behind, uh, which could have potentially have flatted a hand like ace-king or um you know have ace queen and just decides to go for it uh so he's not guaranteed to he's not closing the action so he's not guaranteed to see a flop so that should tighten up his range a little bit further as well but i think um yeah given the stack depth here i think it's a very attractive three betting squeeze spot uh for those reasons and i think we really want to use this, these type of holdings um hands that play well if we get flatted because we should still get be expected to get flatted and have to play play post flop a fair amount uh given that we're so deep uh but we, uh oh i do elect to call here i know i i used a randomizer during this tournament so i don't think i gave myself a hundred percent squeeze here because i think that would be perhaps a little bit too aggressive maybe i gave myself an 80% racing range or 80% frequency here of uh, putting in that squeeze. I would expect this to have been an event where I rolled a low frequency number and ended up taking the passive route instead, which is also, of course, totally fine. Now we're keeping a bunch of the dominated aces and, and jacks in, his, in both our opponent's ranges, which would have otherwise folded. And we still have a super playable hand and we have position and we're mining the blinds as well. So really, uh, you know, can't go wrong here, but I would have preferred uh, or hoped that I would have liked to squeeze this more often than not. Oh, yeah, I remember this. Huh? 
and now we get squeezed by the big blind instead. So <laughs> now we, we put ourselves in a, a bit of a funny spot here because obviously the same reasoning for me wanting to squeeze pretty wide for value, the same can be said about the big blind. Although the big blind doesn't have position, of course, but he also has the added money from me, right? Because I'm if I'm not squeezing, you know, like I'm never, I'm never flatting a really strong hand here. So he's, I'm sure he's not too worried about me and pretty optimistic that he can fold out at least myself and the cutoff who neither of us selected to three bet. And this is why it can be quite dicey to call too much um, because you, you do get vulnerable and you do have a perceived capped range in a lot of instances. Here with this stack tip though, doesn't really matter that much. I mean, it's never fun to be capped, meaning that there's hands in my range that the big blind basically can exclude. I never have aces or kings here or ace king. I'm just never flatting those hands here, but that's fine. I mean, I still have a lot of playable hands that I can take a flop with here, even versus the squeeze. Yeah, and it does fold back to us and I like to call. I think this is uh, kind of a mandatory call here. Obviously, we're on top of our calling range to begin with. And if my assumption is right that he should have a fairly wide squeezing range here, I think he should squeeze a lot of worse suited broadways that we currently dominate. We're in position. Uh, we're really deep. We have a suited broadway ourselves with the enough potential. So I think, yeah, standard call here, although it is, you know, not super fun because we we do put in a decent portion of our stack. And now all of a sudden we're playing 125k pot with 200k behind. Not the best flop, not the worst either, but yeah, I think we would require a backdoor flush draw here to continue, even versus this tiny flop bet. It's still a pretty big bet, given that the big blind is like 3,500. So the bigger problem is our pot to stack ratio, that the fact that we only have less than 2x pot left to play. And whenever that's the case, we can't really go ahead and, and float that wide because it's going to be really hard for us to realize our equity. Even if our opponent happened to have a dominated hand, let's say yes, Queen Jack here, like Queen Jack of Clubs, for example, which would make a lot of sense. It's going to be really tough for us to, like I said, realize our equity. And there's a lot of turns where he's going to continue barreling and we really can't do much. So, yeah, unfortunately, I think we got a fold here. But had the flop been at 10 8 4 with a diamond, I would have certainly had continued. That's how close I think the spot is. So we keep rolling. Uh, this is such a fun tournament. Uh, one of my favorite events of the year, honestly. I don't play all the super high roller online tournaments, so it's not often I get to play a 10k main event with this type of prize pool. Okay, so here, yeah. So. 8-7 off here versus uh, Jason's low jack. Never squeezing here, uh, never folding, so pretty clear call. I would have to have a suited hand in order to squeeze, 8-7 uh, suited. So on this flop versus the small C bet, we could consider check racing, but I think the board and our particular holding is a little bit too bad to do so because Without the club in our hand, there's just so many ways that the board is going to develop where we really don't know where we're at or we lose a lot of equity. Even calling here is, is a little bit dicey. Had I faced a bigger bet, I would have actually probably elected to fold just because there's so many turns for us that are bad, not very many that are good. Like even if the turn is a nine here, yeah, sure, we pick up 
an open ender, but we're already drawing dead if Jason has a jack. Uh, and it's it's just so difficult to to improve to something that that we're comfortable calling down with. Uh, yeah, this is kind of why uh, you know we do improve on the turn. We're picking up not an open ender, but a gut shot. The flush also gets there, and uh, I hope I'm folding here, uh, honestly, because it's even if I call here and uh, Jason is bluffing, it's going to be so hard for me to show down. A lot of his bluffs here on the turn probably has a club in them, probably the ace of clubs, uh, or a jack, or, or some sort of like good blocker candidate that is pretty likely to continue bluffing on the river. So it's just... Yeah, I don't expect it to go check check on the river very much. And, and for that reason, even if I do improve, I could already be drawing dead. You know, he, he could already have a flush. So for those reasons, I would like to see myself fold here. And I do. Nice. Okay, folds to us. Uh, yeah, so here, now we're a little bit shorter. If you remember in part one, we had a the exact same spot, blind versus blind versus Daniel, where I elected or I mentioned that I'm of that stack that I'm actually open limping 100% of my range that I like to play. But here with sub 50, I actually play a little bit different strategy because now I'm more interested in actually building a pot. I'm not as concerned about loading a pot out of position because with 50, when we're racing blind versus blind, we're using the big size. You can see I go three and a half X here. I can probably go four X in general. But regardless, the pot to stack ratio is going to be a lot less than it is of 100 big blinds or 80 big blinds that it's not going to be as tricky to navigate out of position. So I'm not too concerned about that anymore. I'm more interested in starting to build a pot actually with a lot of my value combinations. Uh, a lot of hands that are actually happy to stack off on the flop. On the 753, at a first glance, looks like a terrible board for us. And yeah, it's it's not great, but it's actually not as bad as you may think. Uh, my racing strategy here pre-flop is actually quite polarized in the sense that I have a lot of value hands that I'm racing like quite wide for value. So we'll have a lot of aces, kings, uh, all the way pairs down to probably tens or nines, um, a lot of suited broadways, a lot of suited connectors. But I will also have a lot of smaller suited one gapper type of combinations. So I will race, you know, four do suited here. I will race six four suited. I will race six four off suit sometimes because those just benefit so much from folding out better hands in the big blinds range, right? So if we're racing a hand like 6-4 suited, we can fold out 10-6 offsuit in our opponent's range. Like that's the, the reasoning behind using that strategy, blind versus blind, that we're really looking to target the auto folds. So racing a hand like jack-6, for example, like doesn't make as much sense because it's not going to fold out jack-7 or jack-8 or jack-9. Yeah, that's the reasoning behind that strategy, uh, so when we get this board, it's actually not as bad as it seems. Obviously, we have to be a little bit cautious here with kings because we're not connecting it at all with this board right now. Of course, Daniel's going to have a lot of the same combinations, like he will have all those suited combinations that I was just mentioning. Perhaps not as many of the offsuit ones, like the 6-4 offsuit. But still, he will have like pretty good connectivity with this board. And I will also say that this is a spot where we're either way ahead or way behind. So yeah, I don't think we have to be too concerned about starting shoveling a bunch of money in here. Uh, I think it might be play better as a bluff catcher actually, because it doesn't need protection from much, like only the ace highs. I don't know if that warrants. Like, I, I prefer to use that strategy with aces here obviously because it needs zero protection from over cards but even with kings there's really not that much to protect against i'll be more inclined to bet a hand like pocket eights or nines here because obviously they benefit a lot from protection from folding out the the queen jack offsuits or, or whatnot in opponent's range
So let's see what I do. I do go with the big bet here. So I think I picked a strategy where I realized that I'm going to have a lot of checks here and some bets. But when I do bet, I want to bet big because betting small doesn't make all that much sense if my range is still quite polarized and now obviously I have a value candidate, even though I should be a little bit concerned. There's still a lot of hands that he will automatically call here with, like any six in him, any four, uh, obviously any pair, any seven, any five, any three, um, ace four, uh, ace deuce, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, it's just a lot of, and a lot of ace highs too as well. But versus this, uh, when he's facing this size, I would expect him to fold a lot of ace highs actually. So I, I'd really want to, charge maximum value for for those type of holdings and i think even if i bet smaller here it kind of has the same effect the only reason now is that i'm getting a little bit more value from all those can can combinations but if, if i'm betting you know a third one third here or 40 percent my opponent is still going to fold out uh, most of the hands that he would fold to this size and it's still going to continue the same type of range. Maybe he's calling a little bit more ace highs, maybe he's calling a little bit more backdoor draws, but in position here and of this stack depth in particular, I think most players are quite sticky, so I, I just see them continuing with a, so, somewhat a similar range uh, regardless of how big we go. And on the 10 uh, of diamonds, uh, the, obviously a flush completes, Oh, we have the uh, nice backup flush uh, draw to go with our uh, overpair. But, I mean, the board does look a little bit scary now. You know, that doesn't matter. We have to think about what his range looks like at this point. He still has a lot of those one pair combinations, a lot of the 6x to 4x. He shouldn't have too many 10x in his range, except the 10.7s, the 10.5 10 the, the and the 10.3 suited. Uh, maybe yeah i'm not too too concerned about him improving on this turn uh but i think if i check here it's gonna look like i have a give up quite a lot and i do have a pretty nice bluff catcher i think if i didn't have the king of diamonds i would be more inclined to bet but i think with this candidate i think i can actually start checking here and using it as a bluff catcher rather and hope that my opponent bets you know, the 6x, those 4x, um, and any sort of backdoor floats that he might have floated with, with like two clubs, or he could potentially have like a hand like 10 9 of clubs. Um, that would make sense that he would float with on the flop, and it's now a pair, and now he's with a value bet into me, which is nice. Uh, but he does check behind, and uh, we do get there or we make the nut flush on the river so now obviously we want to try to figure out how we get max value from the spot with 2x pot behind given his check back on the turn makes me inclined to think that i mean it's kind of hard for him not to have some sort of showdown value right because he would have for sure barreled his miss bluffs on the turn when we checked to him especially on that run out. So I think he's more inclined to have a one pair hand. Uh, I don't think he checks back many two pairs, even with the flush, uh, because it is still blind versus blinds and ranges are still wide. And there's still a ton of hands like my, my particular holding that he would get value from if he were to bet two pair on the turn. So when the ace comes, it's not easy to get value here from those one pair combinations. But he does have some two pairs that are not two pairs that probably won't value bet. So I definitely think I should bet here, uh, make sure, because I don't think he's going to, I don't think he has many bluffs here. Like maybe he'll turn a hand like queen five um, without a diamond into a bluff here uh, on the river. But it seems a little bit ambitious and it's not something I see a lot because he also knows that I have a lot of diamonds in my range and I will bluff catch um, a fair amount of them. And I also have a lot of two pairs with the ace. Uh, so I don't expect to get bluffed into here. So I do think I should go ahead and bet, target those one pair hands that are now two pairs, target lower diamonds, of course, 
Hansen simply won't bet if I were to check. So I do go ahead and bet 18 into 72, so 25%, which, um, yeah, looks good to me. Pretty small bet. I could potentially even bet even smaller just to make sure that I do get called by any one pair type holding. Uh, maybe not the threes or the fives, but at least the sevens or if he were to have a 10. But I think I could also, and I think I like this more actually, I think I prefer to bet big here just to polarize my betting range. Because when I'm betting this small, it doesn't really make sense for me to be bluffing here with a small size. So usually this means that I have a hand that aren't worth all that much and it's trying to target thin value. Maybe I have an ace or even a 10 or an overpair to the 10, kind of like what I do, but maybe without the, the not flush, which would make it a little bit more vulnerable to getting raised and you know having to fold. But yeah, with this holding, I think I can still target calls from you know all this stuff that I mentioned, all the two pairs and the, the lower diamonds. And I think I'm not maximizing my value here by choosing the size. And of course, I also want to bluff a fair amount on this run out. So I want to have a pretty, you know, I would definitely want to have another size here that's big. And I think this hand category probably benefits from being in there. I mean, I have the nuts. Uh, so whenever we have the nuts, we usually want to use a pretty polarized betting strategy. So we usually want to bet really big to target max value from second nuts and third nuts and whatnot. So I think this could be a little bit of a mistake. Um, not a big one, but I would have preferred to see a big bet here. Somewhere around pot or maybe even over a bet, like 150. But my opponent falls, so probably had the 7x or 5x. So we'll continue. I really like this, actually. Um, I like this candidate to use in my button three betting range because whenever we're three betting from the button we, we really want to target hands that are better than us that we can get to fold and with the a6 uh, we can get a lot of better aces to fold um stuff like a7 a7 off ace ace eight off ace nine off i don't think ace 10 should fold but uh, regardless there's a lot of uh, better hands that can fold there and it, when we do get four bet it's not the end of the world obviously we're also blocking a lot of the four bet candidates and a lot of the obvious continues like a lot of the better aces to begin with and um yeah it wouldn't be the worst to have to pass up on ace six suited here but you know if we start betting if we start three betting ace 10 suited here and we get four bet right or four bet shoved on we're really not liking it that much uh you know we've kind of punted our equity with that type of hand uh, so I do prefer this type of candidate to use in my three betting range, especially of these positions where my opponent has a lot of those worse or better aces that will fold. Yeah, and we do get flatted and not the best board for us. Obviously it smashes our opponents racing and then flatting range with so you obviously have a lot of two pairs, a lot of straights, a lot of pairs and straight draws, open enders, backdoor flush draws, just a lot of things that can continue. Uh, so I think we should just go ahead and check back here, limit our losses and potentially pick up a flush draw on the turn and uh, hope to show down or call one and hope to get there. Yeah, I don't think we should be shoveling any more money in, in this spot. That's uh, good to see. And we do pick up that flush draw on the turn. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, opponent checks again. Yeah, so now... Hmm. So how many jacks do we check back here? Uh, we sh I think we should ask ourselves. So like, how many nuts do we have here? Would we check back ace-jack here? Would we check back jack-10? How many of those... Of, of the hands that are in our three betting range to begin with? would we check back here and that are not improved to a straight? Because I don't think we want to go ahead and bet much wider than a straight here uh, for value. 
And um, yeah, I do think we can represent a fair amount of those hands. Obviously, it really sucks if we bet here and we get check chub. Uh, you know, we're punting away a lot of equity. I mean, we would have to give our, our opponent sort of credit to have the straight already. It'd be very tough for him to have a much weaker hand than that, uh, given that we have the nut flush draw. So, like, what is he really bluffing with when we're completely uncapped and we can easily have the straight ourselves? So, I don't think I would face a check shove here all that often. So, it's not something I'm super concerned about. And uh, I can still get, you know, we can still get him to fold a lot of stuff now because now the the board is all of a sudden quite scary, um, you know, even for his flattening range. So hands like 9-8 suited, uh, better aces like ace-8, ace-9. Yeah, there's, there's a fair amount. Even ace-10 would be a pretty, I mean, ace-10 probably continues because he has that the gutter as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, we might get ace 10 to fold. So we do actually get a fair amount of, we do actually have a fair amount of fold equity here. So I do think it's a fine bet. I would like to see myself betting like 36, 38K here. I bet 26, which I think is a little bit small. Um, I think I should go ahead and bet bigger just to target those type of hands. I think with the sizes or versus the sizing, I don't think the cut is ever folding ace 10 here. Uh, I think he's folding ace nine. So I think it's kind of close, but still I will have liked to put a little bit of extra spice on that bet just to build a pot as well for when I do have the straight and I want to, I'm more interested in getting the money in then I want to build a pot to build out that uh, pot size bet chub on the river. But it does work, and we take it down. All right, so I think, yeah, it's been another uh, 45 minutes. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up part two here. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, I'm continuing to enjoy the series. Don't forget to press the like button. It really helps the channel get more views. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions about any of the hands or if there's anything you want to discuss, just drop them in the comment section below. I'm happy to do so. Any suggestions for part three, it was appreciated. But for now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.